The headlines are full every day of personal person crimes, horrible things like assault and rapes and home invasions. But the news often concentrates on who's doing these crimes, the, 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 the perpetrator and who they were, why they did it, why they were getting caught, and uh, you know what kind of sentence they're going to get and things like that. But for every crime, there is a victim. And their rights are the focus for this roundtable. I'm Wes Talon. Thanks for joining me. At the Focus Roundtable today are Megan Egler-Bright, Director of Victim Services for the Douglas County District Attorney's Office. The Honorable Brian Fortner, Douglas County District Attorney. And Norman Barnett, Assistant District Attorney for Douglas County. Guys, thank you for coming in. Absolutely. Thank you. thank you. Since we're talking about victims' rights, let's start with a definition. Who is a victim? Really, there's two aspects to that. Uh, Wes, there's a statutory aspect. If you look at the statute, it actually defines what a victim is. Anybody who a crime has been perpetrated against. What does that mean? For us, it means anyone who has suffered at the hands of another who's committed a crime against them, whether it be physical injury, like the person-on-person -person crimes that you talked about, mm -hmm. or some type of other injury, such as financial, where you may never even see your accuser. So anybody who's been wronged by another person and suffered some type of loss by someone who's committed a crime against them, they're a victim, and they deserve to be recognized as well. So much of our system is based and focused on the rights of the defendant, and that's very important. It's the reason we have a criminal justice system, but it just shouldn't be about the defendant. It should be about the victims as well. And that's really the focus of our office and our victim services. Does, it, does a victim actually have to be the mm. person that, against whom the crime was committed? Um, you've got... Um, a husband, a wife, a child, um, a mother, a dad, a roommate who was there, witnessed, who were affected by the life of the person who was the actual victim, who are very much affected mm -hmm. by that crime, whatever the crime happened to be, right. um, or in, in, in the legal sense, and I understand we're talking legal sense here. In the legal sense, are they considered victims? Absolutely, they're considered victims as well. And unfortunately, as you know, sometimes we lose the victim to crime. Sometimes they die in cases involving fatalities. And then a family member, uh, a child, a spouse becomes the actual victim. But everybody who is touched by the crime, everybody who's been impacted at at that level, the level you <coughs> described, who's been there and was a part of those circumstances, our office considers them a victim and we're going to try to help them in any way we can. I mean, that's, that's really the focus of our, our department that specifically works with our victims. Yeah, and we had a case, um, a, a fatality in, involving a, a vehicle um, where it was right out there in the public um, on a main highway in the middle of the day where a woman's life was lost. and working with those witnesses, preparing them for trial, many of them use the word traumatized just by what they saw as witnesses. And they weren't even what we would normally consider secondary victims, like family members and people that were a part of the crime indirectly. They were just witnesses. Uh, that's why we represent the community and the individual victims, because we recognize that any time a crime is committed, it does affect everyone around them and the community at large. And that is a big message that we want to send is that if you know anyone that's been victimized or if this has affected you secondarily, we also can connect you to resources. Like you said, legally speaking, you might not have the same rights just as a witness or as somebody just that is affected by this, but we still want to serve you and connect you to resources that are out there because your sense of safety has been violated and sometimes just, you know, just questioning what's going on in your community at that point. So. How can we ensure that the victims get this, even know about um, services, ancillary um, 
referrals, things like that. How can we ensure that people know that these things are out there? Yeah, that's, that's our duty as a district attorney's mm -hmm. office specifically to recognize that these victims have rights and that they deserve a place at the table. They deserve to be heard. So in the district, Douglas County District Attorney's Office, we actually have uh, a branch of our office that specifically deals with victims and making sure that they're taken care of. And Megan is the director of victim services in our office, and she can tell you a little bit about um, how she runs her crew, but they're specifically there. Their entire existence re revolves around taking care of victims and making sure their rights are met. This is a can be a very intimidating criminal justice system. And these victims are cast in the middle of it through no fault of their own, no decision that they've made. They're just victims, completely innocent. And now they're in the middle of a system that can be very intimidating and they can feel like an afterthought. And it's our job to make sure that doesn't happen. And that's why I, I have Megan. She has a heart for this and she runs our department that takes care of our victims. And she can tell you just a little bit about what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, um, thank you. We have a fully staffed victim mm -hmm. services department where every, um, our juvenile courts program, um, each of our superior courtrooms where we have a court team is assigned a victim advocate in that courtroom that works specifically with those prosecutors in that courtroom and specifically is assigned to the victim cases that come through that court. So from the time that we get a criminal case in our office, if there's a victim listed on it, there is a victim advocate assigned to them that is their advocate from that point forward that will walk them through the entire process from start to finish. And of course, sometimes they're shifting around, um, but all, that's part of the reason why we have an open area in our victim services department. That way, I'm, I'm up to speed on all the cases. And if any victim calls and their advocate is not at their desk, they don't get a voicemail. They don't, they, we don't take a message, we, we give them to another advocate that can handle their needs and can address them. Um, so we try to develop that early on rapport with victims so that they know, hey, you have someone on your team. Because like, like Mr. Fortner said, it can feel like you're just out there on your own. And the fact that from the time that uh, you know, a defendant is arrested to the time that we actually start our prosecution process can be four to six weeks because of all the legal things that have to go on in between there. So they can feel already like they're lost by the time they get to us, which we, we try to bridge that gap. But um, from the very beginning, our advocates are responsible for keeping them notified, you know, by statute of the Crime Victims Bill of Rights of any court proceeding that's going on, any chance that the defendant may have you know, an opportunity to be released from jail, and in anything that they have a chance to be at in attendance, we are, you know, required to inform them and just be a sounding board for them. And like, I, I work with Norman on his cases, he's the assigned prosecutor on it, and it's my job to make sure he's he's doing his job for victims Absolutely. too. I right. mean, as an advocate, sometimes my job is to, is to tell the prosecutor, you need to give this victim more attention. And obviously, we have numerous, countless cases going on at once that each of us are assigned to. So, you know, it's my job to make sure that the squeaky wheel is getting the oil and that Norman pays extra attention to a victim who really wants to be involved and has extra questions and wants that face time with him and wants to sit down. It's my job to make that happen as the advocate. Yeah, and every case is different and, you know, as Megan said, certain cases require special attention, and it's not necessarily the seriousness of the case. It's it's sometimes what that particular victim has involved has been involved in, or what they've experienced. And mm -hmm. you know, it's always good for us. And, and when I say us, I mean the other ADAs in the office to know when the file comes on our desk, we have an idea of who the victims are, who the victim is, what their what ha what's been taken from them, what their particular issue is in the case, because of what the victim witness people do. So, you know, when we hit the ground with a case, we know how to approach it and say, okay, well, this is one, A, that has a victim involved. Some cases don't necessarily have victims. And B, this is one where the victim wants to be involved in the case and where we need to, you know, take extra care to correspond with them as we move forward with the case. That's a very, a very good point. When we talk about the fact that we have victim advocates, each one of our victims is going to have an advocate that works for Megan assigned to them. So they have sort of a point of contact at our office. On any given day, Norman may be in court two or three days a week mm -hmm. arguing motions, trying a case. He's not sitting at his desk able to take phone calls. We don't want those calls to go to voicemail. So they have an advocate. 
and it's truly a victim's advocate. She's not Norman's advocate as my ADA. She's not the district attorney's advocate. She's the victim advocate. And I can tell you there are many times when Megan will come to my office and she understands her role as a director of victim services. If there's a failure in taking care of our victims anywhere in my office, ranking doesn't matter, top to bottom. We're all involved in victim services. If there's a failure, she's gonna be in my office to let me know about it and we're going to get it addressed. She's going to advocate for those victims and her staff is gonna advocate for those victims no matter what anybody else thinks. If that means they look at a prosecutor and say, hey, you need to do better with this victim or you need to pay attention to this particular need, that's what they're going to do and they understand that that's their role. We're not trying to make everybody in our office happy. We're not worried about stepping on each other's toes. We're here to take care of our victims and she runs a department that's truly their advocates and she's going to do whatever's necessary to make sure their needs are being met and if it's making some noise and stepping on some toes in our office she knows that's what I've asked her to do and she'll do it and you don't let her look <laughs> fool you she'll do it and, we, and we'll get the job done hey boss yeah. <laughs> absolutely yes, but when you're talking about victim services that's what we're all about in my office every investigator every prosecutor every administrative person every victim advocate that's what we're doing there's the minimum that the law requires. I think a lot of people may not understand that. We actually have a Crime Victims Bill of Rights here mm -hmm. uh, in the state of Georgia that says you have to do these things. So that's for us the minimum. What, what I expect from our folks is that if a victim has an issue or a problem, we're going to do everything we can to help them, no matter what that issue may be. We have to do the bare minimum. We have to keep them aware of what's going on in a case, and there are some specific rights that we can talk about, but above and beyond that, if you're a victim in our eyes, you're really always a victim. We get calls from victims whose cases have expired mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. years and years ago, but we still have built those relationships, and if you're going to call our office in need of help, we're going to try to help you, and, and that's, to me, is going above and beyond what the Crime Victim Bill of Rights has. That's a minimum. We have to do those things. That's just our responsibility. We owe that to the public at a bare minimum, but we need to go above and beyond that to make sure those rights that are not on paper mm -hmm. are still respected. These victims is, have suffered in ways that you could never, if you sat down for days, put it all on paper. You can't even imagine the things that some of these victims have gone through. So for us to think the answer is looking into a statute doesn't really do them a service. Our victim advocates know if they have a problem, we're going to try to help them with it. If it's their problem, it's our problem. We're going to try to get them some solutions, get them some help, even if it's directing them somewhere else. That's why I think Megan can tell you a little bit about the fact that we work with many of the organizations in our community that actually deal with caring for victims who have suffered in certain ways. I know we have a relationship with several of, uh, of the task force and things. Talk a little bit about that, Megan. Yes, um, and actually that, that's what was coming to mind when he was sharing that was a case where it was, we didn't even have the case in our office yet, but I was able to speak with, with the victim early on after arrest and do some safety planning with her and direct her to the, the task force on family violence to file a temporary protection order. Mm -hmm. And in following up with her, uh, I realized that she, she didn't have a way to her appointment to file that order and her safety was at risk because the person had, had been able to bond out of jail and um, uh, it was it's, basically it's, threatening it's not, someone. It's, well, well, yes, uh, it had been an assault, so, okay. and she was so filing personal a personal safety was yes. the issue. And um, it's statutorily, I don't have to, you know, make sure she gets to her temporary protection order appointment. But I, I, I went and got in the car and went and picked her up and, and took her to the task force, sat there with her while she filed it, got to hold her little baby, and um, you know, made sure that she got that done, and worked with the task force to make sure that that victim got served, and that's. That's why those relationships with our community partners are so important so that I know when I hand a victim over to another, another organization, I know they're going to take care of them and they, they can feel the same way about a victim that they send to me, that they can say, call Megan in the DA's office and she'll tell you all about the criminal justice process and what to expect next because that's not my thing. And so, you know, if, if I have a victim that needs shelter, I know I can call the share house and I can say, to Marie that, that runs the housing program mm -hmm. over there, hey, I have a victim who really needs help. And unfortunately, 
Victim services um, organizations are bombarded with people from the community that need, need, need. There's, there's endless need in our community for all kinds of services. So it's beneficial for the victim and for the service providers to be able to have that rapport where I can call them and say, please take care of this person and know that they will do it. And so we work closely with the folks at the Share House. Um, to make sure that we're supporting their efforts to serve domestic violence victims and their right. children. We, we serve uh, on the Family Violence Task Force, um, which meets monthly, and we talk about how are we doing serving our victims of domestic violence and sexual assault in our community. You know, what can we improve on? We write protocols together and things like that to make sure that everybody's at the table. That's what a task force is, and we have a really good task force here in Douglas County and the folks over there run a great program and we we meet monthly to discuss child abuse cases in our county as well as child fatalities as they occur um, but that's the you know you were talking about if a case lands on your desk right if it, if it gets assigned to you but then you you refer to you found out about so mm -hmm. do we have people in the city police department in the sheriff's department and other law enforcement who basically gives you a heads up. One uh, of the things um, that something happening yeah. before it actually Well we have we have the process that a case naturally goes through. You know, someone is is arrested in a case where a victim is involved and that person is taken to jail. Well, that victim's rights, they begin right at that moment. And you have to understand that a lot of these situations involve a need that is not really met by the particular procedure that we have for a case to work through. For example, if an individual has been the victim of domestic violence and the abuser has been arrested, it could possibly be a misdemeanor. They could go to first appearance the very next morning, go before a judge, get a bond, and be released that very same day before all of these services have been in place to help that victim. So what we've tried to do is improve our ability to be quicker to react quicker, to recognize those cases. So the Sheriff's Department works with us and will let us know when we have those cases. We actually go to bond here and it's one of the things that I make sure that our office does every day. Every day when we have first appearances in magistrate court, I make sure we have an investigator there and one of our ADAs and oftentimes a victim advocate as well so that we identify those cases and we recognize if we have victims there who, who are in need of services. But as Megan said, you may find out about a case and realize that this person is in need of a protective order immediately. And we understand in the DA's office that by partnering together with other organizations and by making the system recognize what other people are doing, when we rely on each other, we can accomplish more. And so it may not necessarily be Megan's duty to make sure that this victim gets a protective order. Megan understands by the fact of helping her get this protective order, him or her, then that gives us another tool in the justice system to protect that victim if a defendant violates that order. Because now, if that order is in place, if the defendant violates that order and contacts that victim, whether it's violent or not, depending on what the order says, then all of a sudden we have the tools to possibly put that defendant back in jail if they're not going to follow the court's orders and follow these protective orders. So Megan understands that by helping this process work, even though it may not be her exact responsibility. Once again, that, that black letter law may not be written that that's what Megan is supposed to do. She understands that we're here to serve victims. To better protect the victim, we need to make sure they understand the protective orders that are out there and get them in touch with another organization who can help them do that. Because at some point, if that defendant violates it, then they're going to come right back and stand right in front of that same judge and they're going to be held accountable for that. And it's going to be an additional crime. And at some point, if we're all doing what we should be doing, then we're going to have a better ability to protect those victims. And I think that's really what it's all about. It's all about us working together and recognizing the other services that are available in our community. It's very important for me that we improved our relationship in the district attorney's office with our community partners who are serving victims. So we actually have one of our ADAs who sits on the board at Share House. So he's involved in the day-to-day -day operations and, and making decisions. His name is David Amati. And so now we've built this relationship. 
So we have an attorney who's there, a prosecutor who's there on the board. We have Megan who interacts with them regularly so they know if Megan has called me, they trust because we've built this trust up that there is a need for service here and they're going to listen to us. That allows us to better serve our victims just by working together. Mm -hmm. And so that's been kind of a focus since I've been dis district attorney. And let me tell you, the hearts that my prosecutors and victim advocates have, it, it's, it's not been something I've had to push them into. If, if you're going to work in a district attorney's office, you have, a ha have to have a heart to serve victims, and each one of them have that. So together we've tried to improve our relationships in the community so that just that we can better serve the victims. We don't want to be so caught up in just prosecuting cases. And, and that's what we do. Ultimately, that's our responsibility. Norman gets a case, and it's his job to to do justice in that case and to seek prosecution if that's the right thing to do. And sometimes it may be that he's taking that case to trial and asking for dozens of years in prison. Sometimes it may be that that person's going to get out of prison. During that entire process, it's important that we're engaged with our victims so that we understand their needs and we're not just caught up in moving a file that's on a docket that we need to clear off. The focus has to be on the victims. I think if we were able, if we were ever in a position where we did not recognize a victim's right, a victim's need to be heard, a victim's need to be aware of what was going on, then I think that would be a failure. I don't care if Norman got a conviction on the case. Mm -hmm. If he wasn't engaged with the victim, he understands that he's going to be in my office and we're going to be discussing that and addressing that. Now, that doesn't happen, but I think it's because we all understand we have that heart to take care of victims and their needs. I mean, you're not doing this job for the pay. You're doing it because it's the right thing to do, and there's definitely a need there. Yeah, and the district attorney's office isn't, isn't like being in, in private practice. Now, we've talked a lot about almost pre-trial mm -hmm. here so far. You know, mm -hmm. we've talked about <coughs> case lands on your desk right. and, and you're prepping and mm -hmm. all of this, and you were talking about witnesses and all. Norman, you're a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. You've been to law school. You passed the bar. You weren't taught this in law school, I don't think. Mm -mm. No, and, and you know, honestly, it's just like anything else. Before I was a prosecutor, I was a personal injury attorney. I worked for insurance companies, and I also represented plaintiffs, so people who had been injured in an in a accident or at work or whatever. Um, and, you know, you don't really learn how to do this in school. You know, you go through criminal law class, and, you know, you'll go through maybe, you know, some other relevant courses like constitutional law that talk about some of the things that we deal with every day. But the only way you really learn how to deal with the human aspect of our job, which is to me, the, the majority of what we do is, is human interaction, be it through, you know, recognizing the rights of victims to recognizing the rights of the defendants. We have a, a unique position in the legal community because we are responsible for everybody's rights. That's, that's our job. We are responsible for everybody's rights. Um, be them a victim or a defendant. And you don't learn that in school. You learn that through watching people like Brian, um, some other people in our office, Bonnie Smith, people who, she's the head of our CWAC unit, and other ADAs in our office. You learn that through seeing how they deal with people, how they seek justice, how they try to represent the rights of all these individuals. When you are in the courtroom, mm -hmm. I remember um, many years ago, actually before you were district attorney, and we were designing this courthouse in which we we're sitting right now. We had a, um, there was a court case in an older building where the offender and the victim had to enter through the same door. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to witness, you know, the screaming of the offender the, uh, at the, you know, I'm going to, Get mm -hmm. your mother. I'm going to get you. You know, you're you know, you're going to be sorry for this and things like that. And when we designed this building, we tried to make sure that that didn't happen. I had never witnessed anything like that before, and it and it it um, uh, I felt for the 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 victim mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely in, the, in yeah, there sure. at that time that they were being <clears throat> intimidated right. as they were going into court. Thank goodness everybody heard it. So. You know, it, it became an issue in court, and I, I don't, I'm sure that the guy got convicted, and I hope he got put under the courthouse, but it was one of those things. How do you handle our victims in a court setting? So, Megan, 
I work with Megan in the victims witness in the victim witness program probably more than anybody else. I've, so I've worked far, with yeah. some other people too. They're excellent at doing that, and you know it's 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 about foresight and it's about trying to determine where people are seating where people are sitting sitting in a courtroom. You know, timing and getting people in and out of yes. a courtroom to prevent those sorts of things. You know. Um, a lot of communication. A lot of communication. I mean, we can never ask too many questions of our victims about what makes them feel comfortable, you know, what would you prefer, and then relaying that back to the prosecutor. And also, like, our court staff is great here mm -hmm. in the courthouse, making sure that we, you know, make those arrangements and letting the rest of our staff and our office know, hey, we're going to be walking families through the, mm -hmm. through the office today to the back elevator so right. they feel more comfortable. I mean, there's a lot of... A lot of stuff that it goes on behind the scenes that people don't see that is why, you know, at the end of a trial week, you know, like this week I've been in trial, um, it, it's exhausting because there's so much that goes on behind and that's why it is important for me to be that liaison between the victim and the prosecutor, you know, to really help him do his job better. It can, and, it can be well, a very, yeah, if he very... He doesn't have to yeah. worry if, if, if you've got the people there right. and you've got the then he can, he can be the hard-nosed right. prosecutor well, and, yeah. when he needs to. And when you're in trial, it's tunnel vision. I mean, mm -hmm. it, you, are, you are focused on all these different things. You have to prove your case. You have to, to again, make sure you're doing everything right. correctly and ethically. And our, our victim witness um, department, they do a great job of, a, of being mindful of all these issues involving victims. And again, that human interaction, that human element of the criminal justice system of, of allowing us to do our jobs and we work in tandem with them to make sure it all is orchestrated correctly. And they can tell us legally, you know, what the, what the victims can and can't do. Can they not be in the courtroom for this part? Right. Help, explain to them why. Because, you know, I say it a lot. Often, you know, I'm not an attorney. I, I've learned a lot of law along the way, but I defer to my prosecutors who I know and I can trust that they will tell me you know, what legally the victims can and can't be a part of and present for. That way we're all on the same page and the victim knows that I'm not just saying, oh, you can't right. do that, that there's right. a reason. The trial process can be very, very intimidating. I mean, when you're, when you're talking about what we do in the district attorney's office, when you're actually in the middle of, of a hearing or a trial, it's not just the most intimidating process for a defendant or a defense attorney, although I'm sure it's intense for them as well. It's part of our system. But it's also the most intense part for a victim. Now they're in the middle of a situation where they have no clue what's about to happen. They just know serious decisions are about to be made that affect them and that affect their rights. They've never been through this process. How many people have ever been the victim of a crime and actually been forced into a courtroom where a defendant is? Maybe they have to testify. Maybe they have to see someone that they're terrified of and that they've suffered abuse at the hands of for years. And so it's very important that we work together to make sure we're taking care of our victims. They're not a tool we use in prosecution. Right. They've suffered in the cases and they're just as much a part of the system as anybody else. And so that's why I think it's very important that Megan and her staff understands their role as victim advocates, and they do, because they're going to make sure that the victims do not get lost in this process of prosecution that Norman was telling you about. As an ADA, when you're prosecuting a case, when you're in trial, you're responding to the defense attorney, you're responding to the judge, you're dealing with witnesses, you're, you're fighting the battle, so to speak. Well, we have Megan out there to make sure that during the fighting of that battle, we don't have a casualty of a victim who's, who's not being taken care of, whose life is being shattered right there before our eyes and we're not taking care of her. So Megan and her staff's going to be there side by side sitting, oftentimes hand in hand really, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with these victims to make sure they understand the process. If they need to step out, we're stepping them out. If they need to go back in the courtroom, we're getting them back in the, court, in the courtroom. They have a right to be there. It's part of the victim's bill of rights. They can't be excluded, for example, just because a defense attorney puts them on a witness list. There was a situation with that years ago where a defense attorney would put the victim on a witness list so that they could say, we're gonna call them and exclude them from the trial process and the legislature recognized that that wasn't the way we should do business and gave them the right to be in the courtroom and to see what's going on if they're a victim. And it's just one of numerous at, rights. At any time. Right. You know that that the um, that the the offender or the accused is right. is in there. 
oftentimes they may be expected to testify. So the judge has the discretion to control when they testify, but there's nothing that's going to allow them to be excused from the trial process unless they do something that would violate that process. For example, a victim obviously couldn't stand in the courtroom and start screaming or holding up a picture yeah. of the one who's, who's suffered. They couldn't do that. Of course, we make sure they're not going to do that. Victims, they don't do that, but they've suffered. So they may be sitting in a courtroom and fall apart emotionally. You can only expect so much from someone. Mm -hmm. So Megan's going to help them out and take care of them and make sure that they get themselves back together and regain their composure because we stay focused on making sure this prosecution is successful. A lot of these victims have suffered time and time again, have been failed by the system in, in mm -hmm. other areas of this state and other states, and they don't have a lot of trust in the system. And so we want to make sure in these particular cases that we're going to do everything we can ethically and following our duties to prosecute these cases to the fullest extent of the law while recognizing that our victims have need. But when I'm on trial, and you know I, I handle the, some of the major cases, I mm -hmm. handle some of the homicide cases, I always know it's never an issue for me to wonder whether or not my victim is being taken care of while I'm up there arguing because I know I have Megan and her staff and I know that they're taking care of them. And in our office, it's, it's really a team approach. If one person's mm -hmm. on trial, we're all on trial. So if Norman's engaged in a fight in the courtroom and something happens with one of his victims, Megan knows she can call me or some other attorney and we'll come and we'll help take care of that. It's a real team approach, but we're all in it for, for the same goal of standing up for victims and making sure they have a seat at the table that their voice is heard. And uh, it's oftentimes during a very intimidating process for them that they don't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, we've referred a couple of times to the Victim's Bill of Rights mm -hmm. and different things that they are. Uh, now we've talked about that um, they have the right to be in <coughs> the courtroom should they choose to be so at any time that the accused is there and they're the victim they can do different things like that that the judge can choose when if they're going to be a witness you know when they would be there and, and things like that um, temporary protection orders we've talked about mm -hmm. that those are done at the advice of sometimes our, our victims adv advocate group um, what about restitution and recovery and restoration Right. Of, of our victims. How, do, how do, are we involved in that? Is your, is your office involved in that? We're, we're absolutely involved in that. Restitution is, is one of those elements that a victim has suffered in a way that may not necessarily be physical. I mean, it may be physical. They may have incurred doctor bills, for example, or those types of costs, but they may have just lost money. We often see these crimes that are financial in nature financial identity fraud, for example, taking advantage of our elders and their finances, where the loss is you've lost a lot of money. You've never even seen the person who's violated you and committed the crime against you. Like I did it may be online, like for that. example. It may be somebody in another state, but they're still a victim. So a part of, of our procedure is the victim advocates make sure that we know what restitution there is in a case. We have um, parts of our procedure that's aimed at determining what the financial loss has been, what has your suffering been, so that we can determine if that is something that we can seek in the criminal justice system. Now you can imagine that although restitution is part of the system, there are times when we'll never be able to collect restitution. For example, if we're sending somebody to prison 20, 30 years, or for life, mm -hmm. they're going to be in prison and they're not going to be paying restitution. Mm -hmm. So it's a part of our process. A victim absolutely deserves to be compensated for their losses. It's a little bit different than the civil world. Norman talked about personal injury and he worked in the civil world where any victim has a right to sue someone if they feel a tort has been committed against them. They feel they've incurred some type of loss. Well, for us, oftentimes we can make it a part of the sentence that you have to pay X amount of restitution. And if you, if you don't pay that restitution, then you could be in violation of your sentence. A lot of times we'll, we'll give that consideration when we're determining what's the best possible outcome in a case. Uh, we never want to dispose of a case without at least addressing that issue of restitution and the financial loss that a victim has suffered. Now, just due to the limits of our system, that can't be the entire focus because oftentimes justice goes beyond 
just the payment of monies. But a victim absolutely deserves to be compensated if they suffered some type of financial loss. But we have to work kind of within the parameters of the criminal law and make sure that's a direct result of the crime. Oftentimes, and Norman can speak to this, they have a right to sue for pain and suffering or something of that nature that we can't necessarily really get them restitution for in the criminal justice field. But we often try to advise the victims, hey, you may also have a right to sue. In so this you case, may you may want to talk to an attorney able, you know, as well. For a civil case. Right. Correct. I mean, a lot of times you can have an, it's something where someone's injured, you know, through either somebody's criminal negligence or through an intentional act where there may be some other kind of tortious negligence, some sort of civil negligence. So, you know, when one thing happens, you can have um, multiple different legal consequences at one time. So, I mean, that's one thing we like to keep people abreast of that, you know, criminal justice might not necessarily be the best way to receive um, compensation for what something that's happened to you or something that's been done, but there are other avenues too. And that's something that we always keep them informed of. We try to be as transparent as possible on the front end and we manage expectations. I mean, you know, when I used to have um, clients, when I was representing individuals, that's, that's an important thing. From the very beginning, you manage expectations. And I know Megan and her staff do that, do a great job of doing that, not just for restitution, but for other aspects of the case. So they all kind of go hand in hand, like Brian said, you know, that's one piece of the pie, that's one piece of the puzzle. It's an important piece, but it's important to keep in perspective of all the other pieces that are going on at one time as well. Okay, we've been talking about restitution and some financial things, and so we've kind of really gone through almost the whole court process here. With what you have learned, practicing law, practicing law, working with, with victims, a lot of times there is nothing that a victim can do to not become a victim. Right. It's thrust upon them by other people who do not have their best interest in mind. But some of the cases you brought up, um, identity, right. theft, fraud, things like that. From the experience that you have, what would you give our viewers advice on on how to lessen their risk of becoming a victim when they can. Right. Well, I mean, I think, you know, it's just like how when, you know, you go to some restaurants or you go to a, a parking lot, say you're going out to dinner on Saturday night, you see a parking lot, and you see signs that say, you know, take your belongings with you, cover up your items, all those things like that to prevent, you know, a possible break-in. With financial crimes and other, and other crimes like that, it's, it's kind of the same approach, you know, be careful. Be careful with your information. A lot of times what'll happen, you know, we discover these cases when somebody tries to use um, someone else's financial information at a store, online. Um, you know, we, we've had some of these cases where people will be arrested and they'll have, you know, 20 financial transaction cards, like 20 bank cards with, with you know, barcode information that doesn't match and things like that, 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 where the financial information on the card actually belongs to someone else. And a lot of times, sometimes we can't prevent it, but sometimes, you know, be careful when you're on the internet, um, you know, putting your information on the internet. Be careful that, you know, when you click on emails, be sure that, you know, you recognize where an email came from. Don't provide somebody your birth date or social security number or address or financial information when you don't know the source of it. And that sounds almost um, common sense, but a lot of times these, these some of these scams are designed to trick people. Yes. You know, they can, they can outsmart people. And also, that's why our elders are so vulnerable mm -hmm. um, to all kinds of crime, not just physical, but these kinds of crimes, too, because if you think about the advancement of technology, it's a different world to them. Absolutely. I mean, and they, yeah. don't, they don't understand. They, they, they don't, they haven't, they've missed that gap of time where they could connect with technology, mm -hmm. and they don't, they don't know that they're so vulnerable, and that's why they're targeted. And that's why, you know, we get these notices of be aware of this scam where they're calling houses and saying this, you know, I mean, the last thing that any of us want to think about is one of the elders in our life, right. you know, falling right. prey to that. But it, it is because Norman said, it seems like common sense to some of us. And even our, our children would say that's common sense because they're in the technology age, but. They've been brought up that yes. way, but particularly our, our seniors, as you said, right. um, this morning, I received an email. Mm -hmm that uh, supposedly came from a bank mm -hmm. and it had the name of the bank and it said 
your account has been frozen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, click here, call here to unfreeze your account. I don't have an account at that bank. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Some of our, so it's obviously a scam right. on there. A lot of people were, oh my gosh, I don't, right. you know, I've got money, I've mm -hmm. got a credit card over here, mm -hmm. things like this. Um, common sense. Yeah. But again, it's, you know, they, people play on people's emotions with this. You know, right. there's, there are scams where people will call. Um, this happened to a friend of mine, um, and, you know, his mom was called about a scam where the individual on the phone said, hey, you know, your son is in jail, right. and, you know, mm -hmm. you need to pay this now so he can get out of jail. And if you don't, he's going to, you know, he'll be in over the weekend, and you need to make sure that he, this, this is paid. And you need to send it to this account, this information. I need your, I need all this information over the phone. And, you know, his mom called, she was an older woman. She was probably in her 80s. And she called her son and said, hey, are you okay? <laughs> you know? And he no, said, yeah, I'm, I'm not in jail, I'm mom. I'm not in good. jail, mom. And then, yeah. you know, yeah. you know, it was a scam. And, and fortunately, she was, you know, um, with it enough to say, okay, this doesn't seem right. But that, you'd be surprised because yeah. if people are doing it, that means it's worked at some point. Mm -hmm. You know, if people are if people are making these calls. That means it's worked at some point. And yeah. some you know, of the things that, that we hear, you'd be absolutely shocked at the extent that some people will mm -hmm. go to to take advantage of mm -hmm. or to access the resources of another person. We hear things that you look at and they're almost ingenious that they came up with these ways mm -hmm. to violate the law. You can only think if, if they would focus their, their efforts in a positive way, they could do something positive. But nobody is immune from crime. But everybody can be more aware. Financially, control your information, your name, your date of birth, your account numbers, your social security, your license, your credit card. Don't leave those things out and about. Shred you can be things. more exactly. Yeah. You can be more physically aware. When you go to, to park in the mornings, when you go to work, you need to think about what's the lighting going to be here tonight when I walk back out, perhaps. Think about your, your physical surroundings and be more aware. When you're out at the mall, pay attention to those around you. Is mm -hmm. somebody following you? Is somebody getting mm -hmm. unusually close to you? Don't just assume it was nothing. I don't want everybody to be suspicious all the time, but we have to be more aware right. as a society. And part of that is, we've talked about elders, for example. Part of that is we have to have responsibility for those who are more vulnerable in our lives. We need to do that in law enforcement and in the district attorney's office, our children. You victimize a child, we're going to take action no matter what anybody else says. No, even if it's your parents who are saying they're not a victim, they don't need to be taken care of and are opposing us, we're going to do what we need to do for that child. The same thing with our elders. We actually have Victims Rights Week coming up. One of our efforts is going to be to try to educate our elders, and we do it every so often, so that they don't become the victim of one of these type of financial crime. They've worked their whole lives. Mm -hmm. Some of them do not have these big nest eggs of unlimited no, money. Some of them have a finite amount of money. And this is all they have to live on the rest of their lives. And there are people who are out there trying to take advantage of them. And they'll go so far as to call and say, hey, this is, this is your grandson. And rather than, they're willing to take the risk of whether or not they have a grandson. And they may say, Billy, this, is this you really? Yes, me, granddad, grandmom. I'm in trouble. Can you send me some money? That's, that's an, an act, a trick that we've actually seen played out mm -hmm. against our elders. Those types of things really happen. It's not just on TV. Mm -hmm. So educating our elders about controlling information that may not have mattered to them years and years ago, their name, their date of birth, things right. they've given out dozens of times, but now they're in a vulnerable position. So during Victim Rights Week, we're going to go sit down with a group of them and talk to them about how to better protect themselves and how to control that information. And, and I think by working with our local law enforcement and educating the public, they can minimize their exposure to being victimized. And then if they do become victims. Right. Yes. We've got Megan and her group, mm -hmm. and we've got the Douglas County District Attorney's Office. Well, um, and that, that's one thing I wanted to say is that for me, as an advocate, it, people always say, how do you do that every day? Oh my gosh, yeah. you know? And, and I, I tell people for myself, it's definitely a calling on my life. I think most people in this line of work yeah. that do public service would say the same. Yes. Um, but for any victim who is leaves our office at the conclusion of a case and, and, can, and genuinely thanks us and says you guys did an awesome job, you were wonderful, no matter what the outcome of the case was, if they do that and they say that, to me that's someone else that's going to go out into the community and 
they touch other lives. And if they, somebody in their life has a situation, maybe the crime's not been reported, maybe nobody's been arrested, you know who they're going to say? Call so-and-so in the DA's yes. office. They were awesome. They treated me great. They listen. I might not be the person who can fix their problem, but I, I, we want them to know that the DA's office will get them to where they need to go to get the services they need. That, that's, that's why the community is who we serve as a whole, even if we're just working with one victim on a case, because they're connected to other people and we're sort of relying on them and their good experience with our staff to make them go out and, and send people to us. So when I get those calls, it, it just make, reminds me, okay, we're doing something, we're doing our job, we're doing good. Yeah, we can't guarantee a particular outcome. We can't guarantee a conviction. We can't guarantee a particular sentence. We can't guarantee the outcome of a case, but we can guarantee you that a victim's voice is important to us and they're always going to have a place at the table. We have to make the decisions that we make based on the law. The law may not allow us to do what a victim wants in a case. Mm -hmm. That doesn't change the fact that what they want and what they've suffered and what they've been through is important to us. So although we can't guarantee an outcome, we can't guarantee a specific result, it's left up to, to judges and other forces outside of our hands, but we can guarantee that we're going to do everything we can to pursue the case legally and ethically, and we can guarantee that their voice matters to us and we're going to make sure it's heard. Even when it's saying, I don't agree with what the district attorney is doing. I've brought victims into the courtroom because I had to make decisions based on the law for them to be able to look at a judge and tell the judge, I don't agree with what's happening here because their voice matters. Not just when they're saying, I love Megan, I love Brian, I love Norman. Their voice matters when they feel it needs to be heard. And that we can guarantee them. Megan, gentlemen, thank you for coming in for the information. And thank Sorry, you for what you do. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having me. I us. hope that this has brought some focus into this subject for you. Thanks for watching. See you next time.